You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth, the show that reveals facts, truth, research, and statistics, and never messes around. With your hosts, Taylor Phillips, Ed Smith, Frank Fajner, and Buck Gino, we lay down the entire truth about everything regarding your Detroit and Michigan sports teams, no matter how uncomfortable they may be. No junk, no entertainment, no homerism, no coddling, no pop culture, no opinions, no shilling, and no fluff. Follow me, Taylor Phillips, on Twitter at DT2Phillips with two L's. Follow Ed Smith on Twitter at EdSmith313. Follow Frank Vazner at Frank underscore Vazner, V-A-J-C-N-E-R. And follow Buck Gino on Twitter at Buck Gino the Third. Also like our Facebook page, The Michigan Sports Truth, and join our Facebook group with the same name. The hosts of the Michigan Sports Truth podcast do not take any suggestions or criticism from any member of its audience on how it should be run. It is up to the host to decide what they want to cover. They also do not intend to be any amount of popular in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Additionally, the views of the audience, right or wrong, do not reflect the actual truth revealed on this program. I named the last episode 286, but it was 285. This one is 286, and welcome to it of the Week in Review of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Spreaker, SoundCloud, and iHeartRadio. Taylor Phillips along with Just Buck Gino this time, still filling in for Ed Smith due to private personal reasons. Buck Gino, how are you this week? Good, how are you? Good. Lots to recap. The Red Wings and even Pistons preseason. you gotta got to focus on Andre Drummond. He, he's been uh, improving at the free throw line. We'll get to that later. Also, Tiger couple Tigers news notes here too before we get to five questions and what's your grade but first off touchdown Detroit Lions the Lions fell behind 45 to 10 early in the third quarter with 1007 left then they came all the way back to within a touchdown about midway through the fourth quarter with an A Sean Robinson 2 yard pick 6 then at the end, they choke it away with a with Jamal Agnew dropping a kick and fetching it, uh, dropping a punt, a muff punt, and uh, recovering it in the end zone and being tackled the one yard line. And then that 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 put Matthew Stafford in a, a very difficult dis, a position. The offensive line almost, pretty much, almost never helped that helped him out all game long and the example of that was he he was forced to throw up the offensive line lack of uh pulling their weight together forced Matthew Stafford to throw throw a judgmental pick six to Jordan in the end zone for a touchdown to pretty much seal it the the Lions find yet yet another way to lose now they're three and three and to top it up top the Black ass cherry on top of the shit Sunday. There, the, Eric Ebron had only one catch for just one yard, uh, for just nine yards. <laughs> you are pathetic! Well, I mean, that game was over in the third quarter, and I know a lot of people in the Lions Day universe, myself not included, but. Um, Matthew Stafford playing in that second half didn't need to happen. And he wasn't really a big part of them getting to within one score late in the second half. And I think that had they put Jake Grudak in, nobody would have blamed Jim Caldwell. Not Number one, because he's coming off an injury. He's playing hurt. They're getting trashed. And it, it, it just baffles me. I mean, I understand that you want to send him out there, but I mean, they're talking about Jake Rudak not having experience. Well, a 45-10 to 10 game is a pretty good chance to get him out there and really have no pressure. And to yes, have Matthew Stafford, who's having a really bad day, yeah. up to that point, get him out of there, let him rest. you got a bye week coming up. And, yeah, they got to within one touchdown, but that was more of special teams and defense than it was the offense to get to that one touchdown margin. And then maybe let him strap the helmet back on and send him back out there at that point. I, I get that. But to let him t- 
take that beating and also to play as, as poorly as he did. Um, you know, he had 13 batted balls, I believe, or 12. Some of that's on your offensive line, but some of that's on him. And you can tell that he just wasn't himself. So I, I really didn't see the logic in them continuing to play him for the whole game. So that said, um, they lose the game to the Saints team that offensively we knew was explosive. Defensively, we didn't expect what we saw today. But um, you know, you've got a hurt quarterback playing, and especially with the news of Aaron Rodgers going down for possibly the season. I mean, with a broken collarbone. Oh my God! Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you got to know that. And I know that you don't pay attention, you don't scoreboard watch, especially Week Six, but. You got to look at it in the NFC Central or the NFC North. I still call it the Central. <laughs> um, the Bears are at a rookie quarterback, and yes, they beat the Ravens today. But shocking, that's not a team that's expected to compete. They're, the Packers are now down to Brett Hundley, who at UCLA was so-so, and he's going to do what rookie quarterbacks do, and that's play inconsistently. And you got the Minnesota Vikings, who are vacillating between Case Keenum and Sam Bradford at the quarterback position. I mean, the NFC North is there for the taking if you're the Detroit Lions, yet you continue to let Matt Stafford stay out there in a blowout game. And I know that you don't want to give up, because no team in the NFL ever gives up. But you've got to be a little bit smarter than that. And if you're Jim Caldwell, you take Matthew Stafford out. It's really easy to get, get up there on the podium after that game and say, you know what, we took him out, he was struggling, our whole team was struggling, and he's hurt, as everybody knows, so let's just take him out and play out the strain. But they didn't want to do that. Instead, you know, having that large comeback and then having it blow up in their face with the Agnew punt muff. And it just really, it was a lot of nothing in that second half. I mean, the Saints were really defensively still pretty strong throughout the game. And it just didn't make any sense for Matthew Stafford to be out there. But they come away with a loss. They're 3-3 three and three heading into the bye week. They're coming out of the bye week next Sunday night. And they're going to be playing as Pittsburgh Steelers team that just beat Kansas City, the only undefeated team left. In the NFL, now at 5-1, and one, and the Pittsburgh Steelers are looking resurgent after some question marks that they had earlier in the season. So, uh, you, know, you don't want to look ahead too far, but you look at this today's game, and Matthew Stafford playing for the entire game didn't make sense. The Lions were not a good football team today, and... I think that, um, you know, this is just one of those things where if you're the Lions, you have to look at it and say, you know, 45 to 10 at one point, um, you know, let's just fold tent, get out of here with as little guys as, as hurt as possible. And there's other guys that got hurt in that second half as well. I mean, they were down to no healthy offensive linemen in the backup position. They were shifting guys all around. And... I mean, it was just a bad thing all around, but yet they still tried to make a comeback. And, again, save that defensive touchdown to the punt return, they weren't they weren't in position to win the football game. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a week of rest for them. It's going to be a week of healing some of those guys and trying to get them back ready for Pittsburgh. And they've got more games to play. But right now with the 3-3 the three and three record, the teams around them in the division, it's not looking good for anybody else either. So um, the division today with Aaron Rodgers going down is, is wide open. And I think the Detroit Lions probably are the most talented team. Now that Green Bay does not have Aaron Rodgers, but the question remains, can they still get over that hump? Can they still win the games that they're supposed to win? And some of the games are not supposed to win and get into the, the playoffs and perhaps win a division championship. And that's something that has eluded them for 24 years. And now, to this year, more than many, seem
seems like a distinct possibility for them. But again, if they're going to they're play the way they play today, um, it's going to be tough. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, their, their offensive line is it is even more depleted than, than it last was pre, just just previously. But, what, but with Aaron Rodgers out for definitely the rest of the season for the Green Bay Packers with a broken collarbone, as I mentioned before, the Lions have a, cha- have a chance to exploit it. The, que- the technical question is, can, can they do so? Right, and that's going to be what is being proved over the last 10 games of their season. They're not going to have to. They're not going to have to win twelve games to win the division. Um, no. it, like I said, it's going to be a very milk toast, blah division with Aaron Rodgers out. Minnesota is struggling. Uh, Chicago, like I mentioned, is at, at, as a rookie quarterback, they are grooming for future use. And Green Bay is now down to a rookie quarterback. At, well, not really a rookie quarterback in Brent Hundley, but I misspoke earlier. He's not a rookie anymore. Um, but for all intents and purposes, he is because he has not seen any meaningful time outside of today, and he'll be the starter for the rest of the foreseeable future unless they're able to find somebody on the free agent where they feel is more capable. Um, that remains to be seen, but uh, this division is up for grabs now, and the Lions have to be able to, even though they're depleted by injuries, have to be able to man up and somehow improve and, some, and, and be able to at least make a run at the division because the remainder of their schedule, while not easy, it got a lot easier with Aaron Rodgers going down because they play Green Bay. They get to play Green Bay, so they'll face them twice, and they still have two games against the Bears and one more against the Vikings. So those seven, or excuse me, those um, five games that they have left in the division, you would think out of those five, they should be able to win four of those which would give them seven wins. And then you look at the teams that they play out of conference, out of division. Um, those are the games that they're going to have to really come through and, and win because uh, it, it, those are some tough games that they have had out, out of the division. And uh, it, bears, it bears mentioning that they're 0-3 against the NFC South this year. They lost to the Falcons, the Panthers, and now the Saints. And they'll have the Buccaneers coming up here in the schedule as well. So not doing well out of their division is really hurting them with still five out of their six division games remaining. Yeah. It, and that's all part of, that's that that all rounds up the entire NFC Nuke North, which I like to call it. Also got a couple updates. The Lions defensive lose defensive tackle holding out of out. Four months after surgery on his torn bicep, he's out for the remainder of the season, he, and he's been injury prone. And they've signed former Packers defensive end D- D- Tony Jones, speaking of the Packers, and a returning defensive tackle, Karan Reed. Wow, long time no see, Karan. So the Lions have a yeah, bye week. Look at their, yeah, they have a bye week, and you look at their schedule here on out. They've got the Steelers on Sunday night, then they have a Monday night game at Green Bay, then they have the Browns coming in, and then they have the Bears. Uh, they have to go to the Soldier Field to play the Bears. I mean, those next four games, um, I mean, three of those are eminently winnable. And if you can get to the, the, the midpoint of the season, or just a little bit past the midpoint of the season at, at seven and four, Looking at their last six games, I mean, or last five games, I should say, um, you know, it, 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 really, it's in their hands. They have teams that they should be able to beat, and it's really going to be up to them if they're able to do something with those those last games. Uh, they've got ten games left, and boy, if, if you can't win, if you can't if you can't do better than five hundred, especially with the teams in their division. Five games left in the division, and what really is a very weak AFC North this year. Um, you know that's that's going to be on them. Um, there's not really anybody else for them to blame now, because for years it's always been the Packers beating them out one way or the other. And now the Packers don't. I mean, they, they had a tough spot. So if you're gonna if you're gonna win a championship or a division championship, um, you should really really focus on it this year because the, the, the path is there. The Packers are, 
without their star quarterback and the rest of the division and the Vikings and the Bears middling at best. So um, it's, up, it's up for the grabs, and the Lions need to take advantage. That they do with it. But to, to take advantage, they need to play better than how they did against the Saints. 52 points is the most amount given up by the Lions since December 30th of 1995, as Fox 2 sports reporter Jennifer Hammond pointed out on Twitter at HammerFox2. The 52 points allowed today is the most given up by the Lions since December 30th, 1995, and a 58-37 wildcard loss to the Eagles in Philadelphia. Oh, man! Yikes. That wasn't a playoff game, for God's sake. Man, those yeah, were the I days. Mean, yeah, well, that's just, I mean, it, it shows um, how poorly the, the Lions played today. And the Saints, for all of their foibles and their weaknesses, came out today and just, I mean, they were very effective and were able to move the ball at will against the Lions defense for most of that first half and into the second half before they got to that 35-point margin. And I think that when you look at the Lions defensively, it was easily their worst game, notwithstanding the fact they gave up 52 points. Now, they, they didn't give up all 52 either, but well, they gave up 45 of them. And you can't win a lot of games giving up that many points. And they've got some things to fix defensively. They've also got some offensive injuries that they've got to try to get some guys back healthy. So it's going to be a difficult task for them, but it is there for them with seeing all the things that happened today in the NFL. I mean, if the Lions can just even get to a serviceable level on defense, they should be able to go on and at least contend for an NFC North title. There you go. Lions are now 3-3, three and three, entering the bye week, which is not a loss, but unfortunately not a win. It's just a, a week off before they get thrashed at home by the Pittsburgh Steelers or probably just fall short, which, whichever. They, they played two good teams, the Falcons and the Panthers, at both at home, and they, and they fell uh, like a, a score short. That, that's probably... That, that's actually probably going to happen against the Pittsburgh Steelers. The, the Lions are going to give it some fight, but they're still going to fall short. That's what well, I predict. They the Steelers team that played, yeah, they played the Steelers team that played today. It's going to be a rough game because the Chiefs coming into that game offensively were running circles around the teams that they had played, and Steelers were able to shut them down, especially in the second half, where the Kansas City only gained six yards of total offense. So... Uh, the Steelers are resurgent. Um, they will have a game next week. The Lions will not, so that, that will be an advantage for the Lions. But still, uh, a Sunday night showcase against Pittsburgh. Um, we're going to find out, really, how far the Lions have come in that game. So, that's a roundup of pro football, the Lions and the NFC North. But now, it's time for us to transition to college football. Michigan. The Michigan Wolverines led 20 to 10. Then the Indiana Hoosiers came back in the fourth quarter and tied it with a field goal with, as time expired, tying it up at 20. And the Michigan Wolverines were forced to play overtime. Karan Higdon scoring two touchdowns, including the game winner. Michigan's defense held Indiana to a, a four and out on, on fourth and goal from the four. It was third and goal from the three. That Michigan's defense uh, blew a ten point lead, but but uh, got the job done at overtime. Uh, ju- uh, th- their offense yeah, was... really struggled uh, again. But Karan Higgins yeah. turn on turn on the Jets. And somehow the Wolverines, the Maize and Blue, came yeah. away. Came away with a win. Yeah, they, they, they get a win, but I mean, offensively still struggling mightily and coming up against Indiana, a team that really in flux. They had a quarterback starting his first college start, and you thought they would 
be able to take advantage of that more than they did uh, defensively. Uh, they didn't do that. But that said, the offense is still the focal point of this team, and it will be for the rest of the season because for all the accolades that they're going to receive for running the football, John O'Corn was not effective throwing the football. And that's something that you have to be able to do. And you're not going to be able to line up as Michigan toe-to-toe with some of the teams that they're going to play down the stretch running the football almost exclusively. They're going to have to find a way to get some guys to catch the ball. They're going to have to find somebody that can throw the ball to them. And you're going to hope that it's John O'Corn if you're a Michigan fan. But against Indiana, uh, it was a very poor performance by them throwing the football, and they were lucky to get out of Bloomington with a win. Um, I, I think that for Michigan, what they're really looking now is you're just going to have to win with defense and running, and that's not going to be a winning formula to play some of the teams that they have coming down the stretch. you got Wisconsin, Penn State, and Ohio State all looming on the horizon. Th- those are going to be tough games to win when you can't throw. And for some people, you know, this is the third year of Jim Harbaugh's regime. You would think that they'd have somebody that was in place to be able to do that for them. And Will Spate going out with that injury now, um, nobody's really confirmed that he's out for the year, but all intents and purposes with three cracked vertebrae, nobody sees him coming back. So you're now, I don't want to say stuck, but you're, you're pretty much limited to uh, John O'Corn or perhaps the redshirt freshman Brandon Peters. And if John O'Corn continues to struggle throwing the football, uh, I think if you're Jim Harbaugh and you really want to make a step forward with his program, he may have to insert Brandon Peters at some point, not to win the game, not to not to go on some sort of run, but just to find out what he has in Brandon Peters because uh, John O'Corn has proven – time and time again, last week against Michigan State, this week against Indiana, that he just is not an effective passer in the scheme that Jim Harbaugh has for him. And he's been in the system for two years, so it's not for lack of reps, it's not for lack of knowledge, it's it's simply just that he's not playing well. And the scheme that Michigan's trying to run, uh, you need a quarterback that has timing down with his receivers, you need a quarterback that has experience game time experience in that system and they don't have that so um, they were able, they were lucky to get away with the win against Indiana but I think that coming up here especially against Penn State it's going to be very difficult for them to win football games especially in harsh environments such as Wisconsin and Penn State um, you're going to have a hard time when you can't move the football through the year. Second consecutive poor performance by John O'Corn, the, the, which means the defense is probably going to have to really tighten up uh, and pitch, start trying to pitch shutouts. And <laughs> yeah. go, going into going into Penn State, the Nittany Lions are second ranked in the AP poll, and they're at home against against the now number nineteen Michigan Wolverines, who have been surpassed by the Michigan State Spartans, who are now number eighteen. Touchdown, MSU! After just barely holding on for a thirty to twenty-seven win at the Minnesota, the Minnesota Golden Gophers. Yeah, that was an interesting game as well. Uh, Michigan State seemingly in command, thirty to thirteen, and for all intents and purposes, it looked like that game was over. And I thought that Michigan State had played a pretty decent football game up to that point. Um, but in the fourth quarter, the fourth quarter, I mean, just it was all heck broke loose for them. And I think the key here for Michigan State is that they were able to get that win. Um, road wins on the Big Ten are going to be tough no matter who you play because you have to come out and play a decent game of football to be able to win those games. But boy, I mean, it, they came out 30 to 13. Really, the defense carried them through a little bit of the first quarter because uh, they held Minnesota the field goals when Minnesota could have gone in and scored touchdowns. They didn't do that. They held them the field goals. That gave them some momentum. And they were able to finally pull ahead. But then in the fourth quarter, getting up a couple of touchdowns and making it real close was the, were the Minnesota Golden Gophers. 
And I think for Michigan State, they have to look at how they played in that fourth quarter, and they know they can do better. Yeah, the, the Gophers scoring 21 unanswered points. Michigan State, their defense missed a, missed qu- quite a few tackles on that last drive of the game. And and that miss, missing tackles is what you can't do. You got you got to finish that tackle. Got find some way to finish a tackle. Yeah, I mean the defense did really let them down in the fourth quarter. Twenty one points by Minnesota in that fourth quarter when they had really been held in check for most of the first three quarters. Like I mentioned, only two field goals. One of them coming off of a turnover um, that they were able to make sure that they didn't get a good drive going, Michigan State did, and holding Minnesota to a field goal late in the first quarter. And then from the second on and through the third, it looked like Michigan State had gained control going up by a score of 23-6. to six. But again, when you talk about field goals, Michigan State not able to punch a couple in there that you can make that, instead of 23-6, to six, you can make that 27 or maybe even 31-6. to six. And then that comeback maybe looks a little bit less impressive, but they didn't let Minnesota hang around a little bit. And Minnesota came back and was almost in, in position to win that football game, but the onside kick failed and Michigan State took the win, escaped with that win. And they're at five and one now and they'll be moving on to next week. Better to add even 34 to six to add on, but those two onside kicks were both miserable failures. That's the that's one of the things the Golden Gophers special teams unit has to work on, really. Yeah, yeah, both both of them not good, um, and it becomes tougher with the, the rule changes and uh, the advent of turf because um, it's, it's really difficult. Um, and we saw in the Michigan game where Indiana very very close to recovering an onside kick, but that took a Michigan mistake in order for that to happen. So onside kicks. Um, it's not a high percentage play, but boy, you would hope that he gets some better efforts than what you saw out of Minnesota. Michigan State looking ahead now, they'll take on uh, the Hoosiers uh, of Indiana, and they'll be playing them on Saturday. It's a homecoming game for Michigan State, and you look at Indiana, uh, a team that is not very good uh, record-wise. Um, they're still battling through some some things offensively, so you would hope that Michigan State was able to would be able to um, dominate that football game at home and really put that away early so that they can get on with the rest of their schedule. But, um, you know, it, it's, it's a week-by-week thing. I think that if you're Michigan State, that uh, you got to be happy to get that win. But, boy, that fourth quarter was a real downturn for them defensively because they just did not play well. And uh, you can't let a team that you're very – very much in control of get that loose and score three touchdowns in the fourth quarter. No, your defense has to shut it out, close, close it, book it. You you get you got to play sixty minutes of defense, not forty five. And the Michigan State Spartans are are going to have to do that at home against the Indiana Hoosiers, who are coming from Bloomington off of an overtime loss to Michigan going into East Lansing at 3.30 on ABC, followed by the Michigan-Penn State game at 7.30 on ABC. But um, Spartans' defense, uh, see if they can, uh, see if they can uh, out-defend the Michigan Wolverines' defense who had to play on the road. Spartans are, are at home. Yeah, you would, you, like I said, you would hope that the Michigan State Spartans, if you're a Michigan State fan, you hope that the defense can play like they did the first three quarters against Minnesota for the whole game. Um, because Indiana, even though they are down and having some trouble, that's the type of team you have to look out for because they don't have a lot to lose. You have everything. Uh, the pressure really is on Michigan State for that game because Indiana coming in uh, with the record that they are at, um, that's that you look at that and you think you should be able to book that for an easy win, but um, it, again, that's that's the type of game that you can't let up on, and we'll see what happens. Yeah. 
shifting now to the mediocre American Conference, the Western Michigan Broncos suffer a heartbreaking 14-13 defeat at the hands of the visiting Akron Zips of all teams. The Zips improved to 3-0 in the MAC, uh, 3-0 on the road, actually, uh, 3-0 in the MAC. But they improved to 4-3. The Western Michigan Broncos fall to 4-3. Um, the, the Zips jumped out to a 14-0 lead. The Broncos had to settle for two field goals and one touchdown in, in that fourth quarter. And, and, and uh, they somehow fell short. They, they failed to score, either failed to score or just failed to uh, force a three and out. On Akron, on Akron's offense, this is, and uh, that's. Well, it was, a, it, was, it was a defensive struggle. And Western Michigan did again. They were down fourteen to three coming into the fourth quarter. They would get ten points, but not enough to to beat Akron. Uh, that's a tough loss for Western Michigan. Now, the one thing that is notable about this game is they were originally scheduled to play that on Saturday night, but with the weather and the extreme rain that they had. Uh, they could not play the game at Waldo Stadium, so they had to postpone it to Sunday. And uh, both teams were visibly impaired by that because you had an extra day for prep. But that's that's really tough because you don't know going into Saturday that you're not going to play. But then you have to come back Sunday afternoon and play instead. And uh, you know, Western just, I think that, Probably they took Akron a little bit too lightly, and they also suffered from that layoff. Um, instead of playing Saturday night, having to play today, and uh, really just a tough loss for them in the conference. Now with Toledo and Northern Illinois both looking down at them, that's going to be a tough go for Western Michigan to make up those games because Northern Illinois, even though they struggled as well on Saturday, was able to pull out a victory. And Western Michigan, now one game full back of Toledo and Northern Illinois, will have to make up that ground in the last games of the season when they play both of those teams back-to-back to end their regular season. Yeah. Western at Eastern next week. The Eastern Michigan Eagles fell just short in a hard-fought battle, 28-27 to at the Army Black Knights on the road. They they just failed on the two point conversion on a run attempt at the very end, and they they just failed to come out with a victory. Eastern Michigan now drops to two and four, and they 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 just. Uh, can't seem to find a way to win on the road. Yeah, they're one and three away from Ryerson Stadium. Uh, they had a chance to win that game, or at least go into overtime. And I think that a lot of people were pretty critical of Coach Creighton's decision to go for two late in that football game. And I think, you know, obviously, if it fails, you're a goat. If you if you if it's successful, uh, you're a hero. So. That said, uh, we, we talked about it in our quick picks last week that Army is going to be a tough matchup for them simply because they run a triple option attack. It's not something that you see every week in college football. Um, so they had to prepare for that. But also, when you're looking at Army, I mean, they've attempted five passes in the game. So you knew what you had to go up against. But it was tough because that triple option attack is so much – it differs so much from what you see on a week-to-week basis, especially in the MAC, which is more of a wide-open offensive conference. And we see a lot of spread looks and read option. So it's a completely different defensive scheme that you have to come in with. And Army was just able to do enough to win that football game and a real big blow, especially to Eastern Michigan now, who is at 2-4. and four. They were hoping to improve this year and get back to a bowl game after they went to a bowl game last year. And, uh, you know, two and four right now, halfway through, but with some of the teams that are on their schedule, it's going to be pretty difficult for them to climb above that 500 level and get a bowl berth. That's true. 
Then you got my Central Michigan Chippewas. Central Michigan! Losing badly at home again to the Toledo Rockets, 30-10. to 10. You are pathetic! Shane Morris and his offense just can't seem to get anything going on, especially at home. The, the the Chippewas have a pretty bad road have a pretty bad home record at Kelly Short Stadium. I I tell you, man. Yeah, I mean they just struggled offensively. You know, we we knew Toledo's defense was good, um, but Central Michigan is that team, man. They they are like I said last week. They're Jekyll and Hyde, and this weekend, unfortunately for them, it was the wrong side of the ledger. They just could not get moving offensively. Only sixty two yards on the ground. Um, you've got to be able to do a little bit better than that. And Shane Morris, 17 of 37, um, was not a good offensive performance for the Chippewas in Toledo. Uh, they they got out early and then really just kind of held serve against the So, um, you know, it, it was it was going to be you know, something that, it was going to be a tough task for the Chippewas to overcome that deficit, the way, especially they were playing offensively. And um, you know, Toledo scores on a fourth down play to get their first touchdown, and it was really all downhill from there. So, um, you know, Toledo at the head of their class as far as the conference standings go, and we didn't think that Central Michigan was going to win, but I thought it'd be a more competitive football game than what it ended up at Kelly Short Stadium. Yeah. They're at Ball State at three, which leads us to the college football in the Mitten quick picks. Number 19, Michigan Wolverines at number two, Penn State Nittany Lions. 7.30 on ABC. I pick the Penn State Nittany Lions to win. Oh, let's see. 30 to 14. Well, I mean, if you're looking at the overall health of the Michigan offense, it's not good. Uh, they're going to be playing a Penn State a team that is talented defensively. They've got Saquon Barkley, who's best running back in the Big Ten right now. And it's going to be a tall task for them. Um, if they have any hope of winning, the defense is going to have to make a big play, whether it be turnovers or flipping field position and giving John O'Corn a short field to work with to hopefully get into the end zone. I just don't see a way that Michigan's going to be able to move the ball effectively down the field against Penn State. So with that said, uh, I'm going to predict Penn State's going to win. I don't think it's going to be as much of a blowout as as some of the people are predicting. Uh, But I'm going to have Penn State winning that game 27 to 10. All right. Then you got the Indiana Hoosiers at the number 18 Michigan State Spartans. I'm going to pick the Michigan State Spartans to win 27 to 13. If they can, if they can clean up their fourth quarter defense. Yeah, uh, you look at Indiana from what we've seen out of them this year. Uh, Michigan State, you would think, would not have a problem with them. Um, but the thing, the theme in college football that looks like this year is um, the trends are going to be. Uh, just thrown out the window. Uh, a lot of teams, you know, Clemson losing on Friday against Syracuse. Washington State just getting absolutely obliterated against California, who's not uh, a great football team. But Washington State just got got it handed to them um, really over four quarters. So some high-ranked teams falling by the wayside. Uh, that said, um, you look at Michigan State, uh, you would think they'd be able to handle the Indiana Hoosiers with ease. But as we saw against Michigan, you've got to be able to move the football. And I think that Michigan State obviously has a better offense than Michigan does right now. So with all of those factors working in, um, I think that Michigan State should cruise. And you would hope that they were able to put forth a better effort than they were defensively in the second half that they did yesterday. So I'm going to go with Michigan State. Uh, I think that they're going to win handily. And I think they're going to get their, their issues fixed. I think Michigan State's going to win that game. 38 to 10. Okay. Yeah, I think I might agree with your prediction there. Then you got the Western Michigan Broncos at the Eastern Michigan Eagles at 2. It's going to be a good one. The Broncos have better recover. I'll let you predict first. 
Well, we saw the struggles that Eastern Michigan had against the football, or running the football against Army. Now, again, Western is an Army, but they're still a talented team running the football. They've got a three-headed attack at the running back position, headed up by Jarvie and Franklin. Uh, Tim Western's squad coming off a loss at home to Akron, which is a team that they should be beating. Um, that's going to really stick in their craw. And I think that Eastern Michigan, the way that they struggled to defend the run, is really a harbinger for disaster when you're playing a team like Western. So I think that Western um, should handle Eastern relatively easily. Um, Eastern did have some, some decent offensive output by Brandon Roback. He had four touchdown passes in that game against Army. But, uh, again, that's Army. And Western Michigan has a much better defense than that. So I'm going to go with Western uh, in a real slow-paced defensive type of, of battle where they're going to try to control the clock in the field position. I'm going to go with Western 24 and Eastern 14. I'm going to go Western Michigan 30 and the Eastern Michigan Eagles 17. Still, Western Michigan is going to prevail on the road. They, they they just need to play better than they did against Akron, and I'm sure they will. Then you got the Central Michigan Chippewas at the Ball State Cardinals at 3 o'clock. The last time the Chippewas played on the road, it was in Ohio against the, the best team in the MAC East, the Ohio Bobcats. And the Central Michigan Chippewas pulled out a victory 26-23 a, a week ago. They're playing a, a very bad Ball State Cardinals team from the Mac Least, as Frank Vagner likes to call it. The Chippewas, I, I actually like their chances of winning, just just not by just not by too much. Except Sh- Shane Morris has got to get his offense back going again. I'm going to predict the Central Michigan Chippewas to win 17 to 14 as a precautionary pr- prediction. We've got Ball State who's coming off of a bye, and traditionally in the game of college football, that tends to be an advantage. You have two weeks to prepare for an opponent. Um, But that said, Ball State is not a good football team. Defensively, they struggle. I mean, Akron hung 31 on them the last time they played, and we didn't think that Akron was that good. So uh, I think that Central Michigan should have some success offensively. It's going to be defensively that they're going to have to improve and uh, really get things squared away because um, I, this team just, uh, as I said, and I'll keep saying it, is a Jekyll and Hyde team. One week you're going to get them, and they're going to look like uh, a team that could compete for a MAC title, and then you're going to get them in the next week like they saw against Toledo and absolutely fall flat on their face. So that said, um, I think with Ball State, it's going to be a struggle early, uh, but I think that Central Michigan just has more overall talent. And I think defensively, both teams struggle. Um, so I think this is going to be a little bit more high scoring. I think I'm going to have Central Michigan winning this game 41 and Ball State 27. Mm, okay, almost a slugfest. All right, so that's our college football in the mitten quick pick segment. And that is all the football that we have rounded up for this episode. Now we transition to hockey. <laughs> three-game road trip that they had, um, they hover right now in... Well, technically three and four starting in Ottawa, but they lose in Dallas in a game where Peter Morazic got his first start. He gave up three goals plus the empty netter. Then Jimmy Howard started the game in Arizona, gave up up two goals, which is not bad. The, The Red Wings... Took it took advantage of the Coyotes' uh, awfulness and won four to two. Luke Glendening, a, a game winning short handed goal of all people. Oh man! Yeah, well that play was all Dylan Larkin and, and Luke Glendening just had the fortune of being with him as we saw that play. Dylan Larkin skating around two Coyotes defenders and making a terrific pass to Luke Glendening to get them that third and game winning goal. Um, you, you look at the Red Wings, though, and you look at the numbers and how they played these games. Um, 
against Phoenix and Las Vegas, two teams that are projected to be towards the bottom of the standings in the Western Division. Um, yeah, again, the NHL is a league of parity. It is supposed to be closely contested. And I thought that for a team that played back-to-back games, Detroit actually played pretty well on that second game of the back-to-back against Las Vegas. They had a rough second period, uh, but were able to come out in the third and really exert their will, ending up to winning that game. I believe it was 6-3. to three. Um, But that said, they're going to be playing some tougher teams down the stretch. Um, they did beat Ottawa. You're, you're right, and I was wrong. They did start the road trip in Ottawa, beating the Ottawa Senators in overtime. Shootout. And, um, and and I think that for the Red Wings, it's, it's a great start, but looking at them as a team, um, it, it's going to be very tough for them to replicate that type of success through an 82-game 80 80 schedule. So um, each week is going to be its own challenge, and I think that coming back home should be a lift for them, but they're going to get into the meat of their schedule here shortly, and we're going to find out exactly how much they have improved. Looking at some of the standings, though, um, it's a little, a little bit surprising. Again, we're very early in the season, but you have teams like the New Jersey Devils, who are at 4-1, uh, teams like Columbus, who is, who is at 4-1 and one right now. And other teams that are on the bottom end of that, the Montreal Canadiens right now, 1-3-1, one, and one, playing just awful hockey um, and not really doing anything that the pundits had thought that they would do. Um, you also have um, some other teams at the bottom of that Eastern Division heap that were expected to be there. The Bruins right now at 2-3. and three, um, They lost to Las Vegas today, in fact. Um, so they slipped to 2-3. and three. So there's a lot of early season turmoil and there's a lot of early season hope but as I said before over the 82 game schedule I think that the Red Wings a lot of their shortcomings and flaws will be exposed by some of those better teams Uh, you know we talk about the Torontos the Tampa Bays uh, the Pittsburghs some of those teams that they're going to be playing and um, that's when they're going to find out where they're at measuring stick wise because yeah, it's, it's good to beat those teams like Phoenix or Arizona and Las Vegas, but those are teams that you should be beating if you expect to be at the level that the Red Wings think they're going to be at. So um, that said, um, it, coming back home will be a lift for them. Getting back into their own time zone and playing some home games will help them. But each week is a challenge, and uh, you know they've gotten some goaltending. They've been bailed out a couple of games by Jimmy Howard and uh, they were able to, to win some games, uh, win a couple games that maybe they shouldn't have, or at least um, perhaps they didn't think they were going to. So um, they're, they're going to be playing against Tampa Bay, it looks like, tomorrow, and then they have Toronto play. They go, they go to Toronto on Wednesday, and then they play Washington back at home on Friday. So this week, um, fraught with some challenges for the Red Wings. Also, they're home against the Vancouver Canucks on Sunday, I think. But um, I want to touch on a couple things here. Uh, The Vegas Golden Knights game. Uh, The Golden Knights were turning the puck over in the third period, and it cost them four unanswered goals by the Red Wings after they were trailing three to two. Um, The the, the Vegas Golden Knights started off 3-0-0 before losing two straight. That... Uh, losing at home to the Red Wings? Jeez. Man, uh, uh, turnovers can, can can kill you. Like one of the one of my what like a guy pointed out to me when I was watching the game at Buffalo Wild Wings in Mount Pleasant after I called the Ithaca Hemlock game, the, the Yellow Jackets smothered the Huskies on the road fifty five nothing to easily remain undefeated at eight and zero and win the T V C West Championship. But but man, the Red Wings actually took advantage. Uh, also, Franz Nielsen, the game-winning goal in the shootout in Ottawa. But but Jimmy Howard overall has outplayed Pina Morazic. The def- the defense is the Red Wings' awful defense has actually uh, exposed the the goaltending comparison. Well, it has. Um, I mean, their defense is still not good, um, but. Jimmy Howard has outplayed Mirazic to this point and the opportunities that they both have had. And I think that Jeff Blashill 
is going to is going to roll with Jimmy Howard simply because he's been able to keep them in games when the defense has fallen short. And um, you know, that said, um, as I mentioned, the schedule they have coming up in the, in the next two weeks, they play Tampa Bay twice. They've got Toronto and Washington this week as well. So uh, those are games that we're going to find out how far the Red Wings are away from where they need to be because those are some of the teams that are expected to compete for an Eastern Conference title in a Stanley Cup final berth. Yeah, the way they're starting now, they're trying to save Ken Holland's job. we we got to be aware of that. Ken Holland's in the last year of his contract, as we all know, like Frank Vashner pointed out last week, and – Ken Holland is still is still the perpetrator here in this Red Wings organization. Well, absolutely. I mean, it, they're in the spots that they are because of the moves that have or haven't been made. Um, Andreas Athens is still unsigned, and it doesn't look like any headway is going to be made in that negotiation anytime soon. Um, and I've said it before. I think it's going to take Detroit. Um, uh, really a big collapse from them to be motivated to go to the negotiating table with him. Um, and right now they don't have that pressure. But as the season wears on and guys either get hurt or go into slumps, as it always happens with any team and any player in the National Hockey League or any professional sports for that matter, uh, the pressure can intensify. And I think that going into this week, this is going to be a real test um, to find out, like I said, where they're at talent-wise with some of the better teams in the Eastern Conference. And regardless of how the goalie plays, whether it be Peter Razek or Jimmy Howard, um, you know, if you don't have a good defense in front of you, you're going to end up giving up goals regardless of who you are. And you talked about turnovers and giveaways. The Golden Knights, boy, they had a couple of chances earlier. Like you said, the, the second period was pretty rough for the Red Wings. And they missed some chances to even score more goals in the three that they did. And then in the third period, they did all collapsed, and really the Red Wings took advantage, as you said. So we'll find out if they can play that way against some of the higher caliber teams in the NHL. Yep, looking forward to it. Now transi- transitioning to hoops. Left side line, three, and he answers. Preseason basketball, the Pistons rounded out the wrap up their regular season losing badly at the Toronto Raptors 116 to 94 and then losing a close one at the Milwaukee Bucks 107 to 103 Andre Drummond played played in both of those games in Toronto he shot 6 for 6 from the free throw line and then he then he was uh, 4 for 6 at Milwaukee he finished 16 of 20 from the free throw line in the entire preseason I love it and that's uh, that's actually an improvement, and it and, and like I said, like I point out as usual, preseason does not count, but it does matter because it can carry over to the regular season. And this is an improvement that we we may look forward to for Drummond at the free throw line this upcoming regular season. Well, you would hope that it was able to continue, maybe not at that pace, um, just the way that career wise Drummond has shot the, the basketball at the free throw line, but you would hope that he'd somehow have turned the corner because that was one of the gaping holes in his game ever since he's gotten into the league, and it hasn't gotten any better. Uh, you look at the, the teams that they played in the preseason. Um, you know They played all Eastern Conference teams, and it's hard to look at those preseason results and, and really dig a whole lot of meaningful data out of them. Uh, the 16 for 20 does stand out, though, because that's pretty independent of a lot of things. Um, Free throw shooting is something that you can look at and say, okay, he's on a good trend or he's not on a good trend. And right now, Andre Drummond is on a good trend. 16 of 20 uh, translates to a really high percentage, obviously way higher than his career percentage has ever been. Um, But we're going to find out here as the season wears on, the regular season wears on, if he's able to continue that or at least have some sort of pace uh, with the free throw shooting overall, I think defensively for the Pistons, they have some, some worries. And again, you're playing preseason balls, so it's not as important, but you're right, it does matter. Um, they gave up triple digits in their three losses 
and in their two wins, they didn't. So that magic number seems to be around 100, where if they're playing good enough defense to not give up 100 points, they're going to have a chance to win that game. Whereas on the flip side, if they're giving up 100 points, it's going to be relatively difficult for them to come away with a win. So um, I think offensively they performed just about as, as, ex- as expected. Um, but defensively, they have some things to work out. And again, playing some of those teams that uh, are at the top of the Eastern Conference, they didn't play anybody like Boston or Cleveland, which is somewhat surprising to Cleveland anyway in the preseason. But that said, um, they will open the season Wednesday against the Hornets, and we're going to go from there. And then we'll see where the season takes us. I think Andre Drummond, if he could even shoot... 60% from the foul line would be a massive improvement over what he's been able to do the last couple of seasons. It, it, it would be uh, fair enough to to expect Andre Drummond to, to shoot 60%. Plus the Pistons, after holding in Charlotte in the season opener at Little Caesars Arena, they're at the Washington Wizards Friday at 7, and then at the Knicks Saturday at 8 o'clock at Madison Square Garden. The Pistons have waived Benno Udry, and they picked up team team options on Stanley Johnson and Henry Ellenson. So, well, I mean, yeah, Peter Andre was their third point guard last year. Um, didn't see a lot of playing time. He was no. pretty much insurance for if injuries hit in a real Very tough good. spot. Very good point. The Pistons, um, Stanley Johnson and Henry Ellenson both were on entry level contracts. Uh, they were on rookie contracts, as the NBA would, would call them. So. Picking up their option years really isn't something that was unexpected, um, but it does mean that they're accelerating their development, and they're hoping to see something out of them. Ellenson didn't get a whole lot of playing time at all last year as a rookie, and they're expecting him to step into a larger role starting this year and hopefully going into next year now that they've picked up the option. Mm -hmm. So that rounds out Pistons basketball. Now one team left to cover. That one is long gone. In baseball, former Miami Marlins, uh, current Miami Marlins third baseman, third base coach Freddie Gonzalez, who was a former Atlanta Brave, was was a candidate for the next Tigers manager. Now emerging as the favorite thereof, and and that's uh, pr- pretty shocking to me. Well, I mean, it belies a lot of the organizational philosophy that Al Avila has touted since he's been the general manager. And you look at the, the movement towards guys who understand the advanced statistics and really are able to grasp some of the things that Brad Ausmus could not over his four years as Tigers manager. And Freddie Gonzalez is a noted what you would call old school manager and his tenure with the Braves and even um, with the Marlins was fraught with a lot of, um, I, I don't want to say drama, but it was fraught with a lot of um, things that people were not, didn't, didn't really agree with his handling of the ball club and the Braves, especially in, in, in the downturn after winning so many National League East titles finally coming to rest, and he didn't have the resources that other Braves managers had, but his, still his handling of how they compiled their roster and in-game situations is widely panned. And it's a little bit shocking, simply because El Avila has always said that they want to pay attention more to the Sabre metrics. They want to pay more attention to advanced stats. They want to pay more attention to different methods of coaching. I mean, I look at the article today, um, Justin Verlander for the Houston Astros, when you look at how he's pitched in the postseason, you're talking about a guy who's a Hall of Famer to begin with, and yet he gets to Houston, and with their innovative video breakdown of his delivery, was able to get his slider back on track, and really is, is pitching some of the, the best baseball of his career because of that adjustment that he was able to discern with the Houston coaching staff. And then you look at the Tigers who don't use any of those things that 
some of the other teams that are playing still in the month of October are using. And it's disheartening to see that they're considering a guy like Freddie Gonzalez because that's kind of backward thinking in the fact that if you want to succeed, you want to advance into the new age of baseball, you're picking a guy that is decidedly on the opposite end of that spectrum. And that's, like I said, that's disheartening, but it's also confusing because you would think that a chance that was given to Brad Osmus, who they thought would be a higher level thinking guy, and in fact was the quite was the exact opposite. Um, now they're going moving with Freddie Gonzalez, who is not, is not what you're looking for, especially it's a guy who's going to manage what's going to be a young, an untested team for the most part. Um, you know, they're going through a rebuilding phase out of the type. So you would think that they would get somebody that was in tune with the advanced statistics and all of the methods that are being used now in Major League Baseball to help some of the players. And um, you know, it, it, it's it's something that doesn't make a lot of sense. But at the same time, um, it, it's not a lot of guys stepping up to, to take over a team that really has been gutted from top to bottom of a lot of talent. Yeah, Justin Verlander pitching a full nine innings, giving up only one run and getting the win in the Houston Astros. 2-1 walk-off win in game two in the ALCS against the New York Yankees at Minute Maid Park. Verlander pitched a hell of a game. He got lucky he got the win. Yeah, I mean, his team does bail him out, but boy, it looks like the Tigers game's old where he was pitching his his ass off, and he wasn't getting any run support. I mean, he knows how to go through those games. Uh, he's, he got that plenty when he was in Detroit, but boy, um, you know, they, he, they were able to pull out that win. A great performance by Verlander kept them in that game. The Astros. And, um, you know, it, it goes back to, I was talking to somebody Friday before our broadcast, football-wise, and, you know, you can do all the advanced statistics and the analytics and all those things. Justin Verlander in the New York Yankees, in the playoffs, Justin Verlander absolutely dominates the New York Yankees when it comes to playoff baseball, and he did not disappoint in his first start against them in game one of the ALCS, and just was, I mean, he was downright filthy at times, only giving up the one run, and gave his team a chance to win that ball game. So um, it, it, it shows that the Tigers were not wrong in, his, in their assessment that he did have something left, but it goes back to they, they didn't have that key to unlock it. It took him going to another organization for him to really truly ground into form and get to where he was back in his heyday with Detroit and get that, that, that slider back because that was a big pitch for him, um, especially over the last couple of years. That slider was really um, when he went to the curveball less to, to release some stress on his arm, he wanted to go with the slider. And when it's not working, it just is really kind of a weak cutter, and he would get hit or all hit all over the yard. So uh, kudos to the Houston staff for finding the problem and getting it fixed, but also you look at the Tigers and the way that they handled it. Uh, they basically just left him alone and kind of let him figure things out. And it speaks to not only the character of Justin Verlander that he was – more than willing to find out using the te- techniques that the Astros staff are employing and really just become back to the dominating pitcher that we're used to seeing here in Detroit. Yeah, the, the Tigers have not helped Verlander or any of the players before he got traded to Houston. The Tigers, the, the, the entire Tigers scouting department and coaching staff was abysmal they just they did not help anybody they just had had faith in all their players no matter what no matter who they played in each game that they didn't even they didn't even do any homework or much homework whichever however you slice it it, it the tigers are not holding themselves accountable that's how that's an that's the tipping point of how terrible they have been well, not only are they not holding themselves accountable, but um, your job as either a manager or a coach in, the, in Major League Baseball. Or scout. Don Kelly yeah, I mean, is likely to join. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it relies so heavily on you being able to the identify rank, those things. The ranks of the ignorant. Yeah. Yeah. Don, I mean, well, I mean, just letting those guys roll out there. I mean, a Hall of Fame pitcher it doesn't get that way by accident. But at the same time, as a coach, you have to be aware of some of the things that are going on. And Verlander, for all his struggles this year, still was, was more than serviceable. And for him to go to Houston and them finding out something that he has tried mechanically that has worked right now um, very well for him, uh, again, it speaks to the Tigers' lack of organizational uh, preparation and really lack of motivation uh, for them because it, that was not something that was done while they while he was here. And that was not just with Justin Verlander, as you mentioned. That was, that was with any player. Um, a lot of guys that are struggling here um, just didn't get the same type of treatment or the same advantages that they're now seeing with other teams. And that's a damning statement for guys that are looking to be free agents when the Tigers finally start to climb out of this rebuilding phase and start to look at other guys, start filling some of those voids that the Tigers have not drafted or looking to improve some of the spots that they are currently trying guys out in. Uh, if you're a free agent and you're looking at things, you're thinking, why would I go somewhere where they're not really going to help me? They're just going to let me play my game. And if I do good, great. If I don't, well, oh well. Um, that's the kind of message that I'm getting from this. And it's, it's not shocking because the Tigers for a long time organizationally have been stuck behind a lot of teams, but uh, for a guy like have it be public knowledge that the Houston Astros fixed his slider. We'll just leave it at that. Um, really just shows a lot of people in the baseball world that their fears were not unfounded that the Tigers really just have an organizational hole in the analytics and the advanced methods of today's game. Yeah. And the top, top it all off, Chris Lynch is still the owner, and he he he, he uh, doesn't hold himself accountable for for uh, not changing anything. He's still going to be the owner of the Tigers for like a year or two more, longer. And he, the only the only way is it, the only way it's all going to change is if he sells this. We need to change the mindset. The Tigers need to change the the mindset when they get a new owner. Yeah, I mean, that's where it starts from because you, if you're in an organizational malaise, uh, your owner is the one that has to really start with the, with the change and that's really that's cleaning everybody out and starting with a whole new slate. But the Tigers are not going to do that. First of all, they they fire sale all their players and get a lot of prospects, which Alex, er, Alex Alavila is... He, he does have an eye for young talent. He, he's able to pick out guys that that really have potential. And that's something that I would never say that he doesn't have. But it's the other part of his job, which is paying attention to the guys he already has. That's where he fell short, and that's where he'll continue to fall short. Especially if they're going to hire a guy like Freddie Gonzalez, who, again, does, does not espouse the values of advanced methods and statistics in, in managing the game of baseball. And you can't rebuild effectively if you're going to just let the young guys run out there and find out how hard Major League Baseball is. You have to prepare them and help them through those transitions. And if you're not going to look at video and you're just going to kind of throw them out there in different situations... Um, you know, that's, that's not the method that people prefer anymore. And with all the information that we have available to us as fans, you would think that the, the Tigers or any club would have even more access to things that we don't. And uh, when, you're, when you're looking at that type of stuff, that can really help you. Um, I know that they have the analysis by paralysis fear, where they don't want to get too in-depth and, and start overthinking things, but... Um, you know, doing the opposite, which is nothing, 
has proven less than effective, and hopefully they can get their organizational house in order and start to work towards what some of the other teams that are still playing right now are doing. There you go. Now, the other story I want to get to is first baseman Miguel Cabrera is being sued by a Florida woman in a child support lawsuit. He isn't paying enough to support two children he fathered with her setting up a legal showdown that could cost him more than $100,000 a month. The allegations, according to Tony Paul, the Detroit News, are contained in court records obtained by the Detroit News that that chronicle a public fight over money and offer insight into the personal life of a married, intensely private baseball player who has three children with his wife of 15 years, Rose Angel, or Rose Angel. Belkis, yeah, I mean, this is, this is something that probably explains a lot of the things that were going on with Miguel Cabrera off the field. And we come to find out now that he's embroiled in this legal battle with child support uh, with a woman that he fathered two children with or allegedly fathered two children with. Um, and we're finding out that this is something that has been going on for a little bit now. And reading some of the things that I have about this, um, you know, this is pr- probably is not a good look for him, but it also lends some perspective as to why he struggled mightily this year. Now, he also has some physical problems, back and groin and hamstring, all things that are well chronicled, and and you could tell that he was laboring physically during the season. But when you couple that with the legal battle that he's been embroiled in, um, it really sheds a new light on his struggles, and you don't know where this is going to end up. I mean, he has a team of lawyers, obviously, that will be navigating this him for navigating this for him and uh we'll see where this ends up but this is not done obviously and uh you're gonna if you're miguel Cabrera, you have it tied up by the end of uh, or by the start of spring training um but that said um you know just another thing that he's got to deal with and with all the other things going on in his life um you know obviously baseball for him um, becomes second in, in trying to get his family life in order. So um, we'll see where this leads us. Um, but uh, you know, looking at Miguel Cabrera and how he struggled this year, um, it really makes sense now mentally where his head was at. Um, physically, he's got some healing to do. Um, but mentally, um, if he could get this situation wrapped up, by his spring training, they probably would help him out immensely, and hopefully, he can move on from that and get back to playing baseball the way he had. Yeah, Cabrera is scheduled to be questioned under oath by the woman's lawyers during a video t- deposition Thursday in Orlando, Florida. Rodriguez, Belkis Mariella Rodriguez, age thirty-five of Orlando, sued Cabrera, who sued Cabrera in Florida in August after. The t- after Cabrera allegedly slashed child support payments, a move that coincided with the Tigers veteran helping her buy a nearly $1 million home earlier this year. Cabrera wants paternity tests conducted on the children, born in 2013 and 2015, and has accused Rodriguez of extorting him, according to court records. His legal team has accused Rodriguez of quote, embarking on a mission to extort additional monies or additional money to be used for her benefit under the guise of ch- uh, the guise of child support. Quote, unquote, according to court yeah. records filed in Orange County, Florida. Well, I mean, this is no different than any other child support case except for it involves a high-profile athlete and the money is considerably different than what most people have to deal with. So uh, um, I think that if you're looking for a prediction or some sort of end game with this, I think that he'll probably end up cutting bigger checks and he'll make it go away. And I think that in a legal battle, the, 
when you look at these type of situations, um, you know, it becomes a, a word, you know, somebody else's word against his word. And, um, you know, Florida law is pretty clear as to what his contribution should be. And she's applying for the maximum amount, which is up to 7% of his yearly salary. So, um, that's where the hundred thousand dollars a month comes into play. But uh, if, if it was me, I think that he'll probably get a, he'll probably get out from under that for less than the hundred thousand dollars per month. He'll probably be go back to paying more than what he was before. And while it won't go away in his family life from the public eye, this will go away. And I'm, like I said, I think if he can get it wrapped up by spring training, his lawyers will be able to to do the best they can. And and really just try to get the situation closed as far as that's concerned because it obviously affected him during the year. So I think that from that point on, um, you know, he should be able to to do that. And hopefully for him and the Tigers, um, you know, they can get away from that and get back to the business of playing baseball. True. A whole lot of information in that story written by Tony Paul about Cabrera and his wife and his children. It, it, it's it's a developing story. We'll see what happens. In, in case you missed that article, we'll post it again uh, on the Michigan Sports Truth Facebook page in case you missed it. So that's Tiger's news that you need to know. Now it's time for five questions. Buck, are you ready? Yes, sir. It's time for five questions on the Michigan Sports Truth. Question number one: Should the Lions have let quarterback Math? Should the Lions have let quarterback Matthew Stafford play through the pain like they did late of last season? I, I'd say a definite no. I understand Jake Rudock doesn't have much much NFL experience, but when Stafford is hurt or injured that badly, whichever you may slice it, it it's best to sit him out. And, and the Lions didn't do that. Well, you mentioned that. They, they let him do that last year. The difference is that they were in a playoff race last year, and they needed him to play through the pain because without him, they wouldn't have made the playoffs, even though they lost their last three games to go 9-7 and seven and lost the playoff game at Seattle. That said, um, this, this is week six. Uh, they were playing a Saints team that, that was just much better than them today. And at 45 to 10, he was clearly struggling. And not only because of his physical ailments, just clearly struggling as a whole. And I think that they should have taken him out, played the rest of the game with Jay Rudock, and let him rest for the rest of the game going into the bye week and really try to get him healthy. Um, he didn't. He struggled even more over the course of the second half, took some more shots, and really just you know, every time he went to the ground, he just kind of cringed um, just because he saw him, and you, see, you could see the pain it was in. And I know that Matthew Stafford doesn't want to abandon his team, but you're in week six of a long season. you got ten games left. It's 45 to 10. You know, maybe just sit down, put the ball cap on, and let Jake Rudock take some snaps because if you if you have a backup quarterback, that's the time to use him. Your your guy is hurt. You're down by a lot. There's nothing to be gained by having Matthew Stafford go out there and continue to battle and potentially get a worse injury because he is already playing hurt. And like I said, we saw with Aaron Rodgers today breaking his collarbone and, and pretty much being out for the season now. Um, at any time, that can happen. And you don't want to expose a guy that you just signed to a $135 million contract to any more shots than he needs to be. And with a depleted offensive line, a struggling quarterback who's playing hurt, it was just not a good equation. So they should have taken him out. They didn't. Um, they ended up losing the game anyway. And they exposed Matthew Stafford to further risk by letting him play that second half. Yeah. 
Next question. Question number two. How badly does Western Michigan's loss to Akron at Waldo Stadium in Kalamazoo weaken their chances of making a BCS bowl game? Well, making a New Year's Six game is almost probably virtually impossible for them now. Um, just because of their record, um, that's going to be really tough for the committee to put them in as an at-large team, even if they were to storm through the MAC, go undefeated from here on, run the table, and, and go. Um, let's see, they've got three. So they would be 10-3 and three if they ran the table from here out, including the MAC championship game. 10-3 and three is a MAC team. Um, that's a tough sell into a New Year's New Year Six Bowl. So I think losing to Akron really hurt them. Had they lost to Northern Illinois or Toledo, but still made the MAC championship game, you could make a case for them. But having lost to Akron now, um, that's going to really, really weaken their, uh, their power index as far as calculating the teams that they lose to and they win against and, and doing that whole calculation. So um, I think that really put it up, not seeing the final nail, but I mean, unless they run the table and win the MAC championship game, they're probably looking at a second tier bowl from here on out. Mm -hmm. Next question. Question number three, are the Central Michigan Chippewas starting to get even worse? I would say at home, yes, but on the road, not quite. They got Ball State on the road. Uh, the Cardinals, like you pointed out, have a have, are coming off a bye week, but I still, like we predicted, I see we see Central Michigan winning. When you say getting worse, I don't know if they're getting any worse, but I don't know if they're getting any better. Um, this is an up and down team, uh, very uneven, and uh, you know the games they played against Boston College and Syracuse, they really got exposed. Um, but those are also road games. So, um, you know, in the MAC, it's just going to be kind of hit and miss for Central. But you got to you got to play better than that at home. I mean, I know that the atmosphere at Kelly Short Stadium isn't the greatest; it hasn't been really since the Brian Kelly days. But you got to do better than that. And for a homecoming game to just get flat laid out by Toledo the way they did, especially in the first half. Um, you know, that's, that's just not really acceptable. And I don't think John Bonamago thinks it's acceptable, but operating with the level of talent that they have, um, you know, I don't know if they're getting worse, um, but I can tell you that you're not getting better. And a lot of people will tell you that if you're not getting better, you probably are, in fact, getting worse. So is there, in a roundabout answer to that question, I guess the answer is yes. And they're going to have to do something against Ball State. And maybe that'll be something for them to springboard for the last half of the season. Exactly. Next question. Question number four. Are the Red Wings really that good, or can they still collapse? Buck, everybody should know this, and I think most people do too, both you and me included, Frank and Ed Smith, Frank Vazner and Ed Smith as well. It, granted, they are 4-1-0, but it's still very early. They they still have a lot of time to collapse, They just to uh, be more motivated to put an end to Ken Holland's tenure as as their general manager. Well, we're going to find out this week because they're going to play three top flight teams. And even though two of those are at home, they're going to play some, some better teams than they've been playing the last five games. And five games into the season is not the time to make a snap judgment on if they've improved or not. It's definitely a nice surprise. But if we've chronicled here many a time, the Red Wings are not a great hockey team. Um, they are by far... Um, I would say probably the second tier or worse as they were last year. And they may, they may improve over last season's point total, which a lot of people did not predict um, in our, in our group. But um, after five games, it's, it's difficult to tell really how much they've improved over last season and the trends that they show in some of the advanced statistics don't lend themselves to long-term success. So, Seeing all those things, um, this, in my mind, is a mirage right now. I think we're going to find out what the Red Wings are really about here, especially this week playing three games against Eastern Conference opponents that are in the hunt for division, conference, and league titles. 
Get ready for the get ready for the roller coaster, folks. Next question. Finally, question number five: Has Andre has Andre Drummond actually finally improved at the free throw line? I'd say yes. Still, time will tell. But like I like I pointed out, preseason doesn't count, but it matters. It can carry over. Like Andre Drummond's free throw shooting, in my view, will carry over into the regular season. Well, you definitely can carry over. You'd hope that there's at least a, a, a stretch there that at the beginning of the season, before the, the travel and the rigors of an NBA season start to accumulate physically and mentally. But you would hope that he's able to turn this into something positive for at least the first part of their regular season. Has he improved? Uh, obviously, his percentages say yes. But we're going to find out over the balance of the season if this is something that he has finally fixed or it just seems to be an aberration. So I'm, I'm pleased to see it. Uh, but at the same time, when you look at his career numbers and his overall performance, it's not something that makes me think, oh, he's finally got this fixed. It's something that makes me think more of, uh, he's doing well right now, but you're just waiting for that bottom to drop out. And as the back-to-back games and the travel accumulate on the body and the mind, then we're going to find out how much he really has improved. Good point. Looking forward to that on Wednesday, starting on Wednesday when the Pistons tip off of the Charlotte Hornets at Little Caesars Arena. That's our five-question segment. And to our entire audience, if you want to answer those five questions, just replay that segment portion of this episode and answer them the best you can without going out of line. Now for the other segment called What's Your Grade? Pencils down, everyone. It's time to find out what's your grade. First of all, the Lions deciding to play Matthew Stafford in New Orleans despite his pain. I'd give them an E because that that, that they're having... Uh, uh, they're, they're having. Uh, 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 let me put it this way. Let me put it another way. They they just they just decide to uh, put Matthew Stafford out there because it, he's he's. He, I get it. They sign him to a number to a to a lo- to a very high expensive long term contract. But uh, when Stafford again is injured, you can't you can't just keep trotting him out there and letting him get letting him get beat when you're especially when your offensive line is depleted that keeps getting keeps not doing their job and keeps get suffering injuries as well Stafford feels alone and and uh, gets abused by that opposing defensive line defensive front yeah I mean it was 31 to 10 and a half and the Saints put two on the board relatively quickly in the, in the second half, the third quarter. And at that point, um, you know, Matthew Stafford ended up the game 25 of 52, so less than 50% completion rate. 312 yards passing, three touchdowns. Um, he also had some interception, or at least one interception that I saw, obviously, was the, the game winner or the, game, the backbreaker, so to speak, I guess. Um, but that said, um, you're, you're in a game that you're not moving the football. And the other team is taking advantage of you in every way. It, they need to get him out of there. And I know the fantasy people are happy because he was able to come back and get 300 yards plus three TDs. But um, you know, over the course of the season, that's not something that he's going to look back and say, "Boy, I really, I, you know, I was able to come back in that second half and 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 get us close to winning." Nobody cares because he didn't even provide the impetus for getting it within one score. Special teams and defense did that. So I'll go back to my original point, which was you could have put Jake Rudock in there for the second half, and if you get the game close, yeah, maybe you let Sanford come back in. But there was no reason for them to let him sit out there and take the abuse he did for four quarters when he's your franchise quarterback and you're getting your ass handed to you. So I agree for that as the same as yours. It's an F, simply because... It wasn't a needed exercise for him to go out there after the game was pretty much wrapped up by the Saints. Yeah, very unneeded as well. 
Then you got the Pistons exercising Stanley Johnson and, and Henry Ellenson's options. I'll let you go. I'll let you, I'll let you grade it first. I'm going to go with a B minus. Um, it shows that they're ready to move forward in those players' development. Stanley Johnson has been disappointing, um, especially because they picked him in a higher pick. Um, Henry Ellenson really didn't get a lot of run last year, so picking up the option for him just shows that they're expecting him to take a bigger step and be a bigger part of the rotation um, sooner rather than later. So it's hard to tell what those two players are really going to be able to, to bring to the Pistons as they progress. But the flip side was to not do that and see where they landed and expose yourself to perhaps having to pay more if they accelerated their development and turned out to be serviceable NBA players. Then you're paying more to retain them. And as we learned with Contavious Caldwell Pope, um, you know, the, the price became too high for them to keep him, and they had to let him go for nothing. Now, that said, um, Contavious Caldwell Pope's a little different than Stanley Johnson and Henry Ellenson. But at the same time, they're just really doing it as a protective move. And if those two guys, or at least one of those two guys, ends up to be what they thought they would be, uh, being picked highly in the first round, they're going to save themselves a little bit of money in that option year. So I give it a B minus because you can't tell how those players are going to develop, but it does save them a little bit of money in case they do develop into a better player. Yeah, I'm going to go with the same grade, B minus. So that's our what's your grade segment. So for our audience, if they have grades or, or if they have grades for each event, post them in the comment below comment bank below this episode and please don't go out of line so that's episode 286 of the week in review of the michigan sports truth podcast on spreaker soundcloud and iHeartRadio. radio buck gino uh thanks very much uh I, I will keep you and frank posted whether or not ed smith is available or not and nice job tonight too yeah there's a lot to talk about but uh you know, that's what happens when you get into this part of the season. There's all sorts of things that need to be talked about. So um, you know, I'm, I'm sure as the, the weeks progress, next week will be a little bit light with the Lions being out of action. But I'm sure there will be plenty more things that we can get, that we can hit on. Absolutely. So uh, thanks very much. Uh, take care. I'll, I'll probably talk to you next week. Yeah, very good. Yep. So... Before we sign off, we want to remind everyone to share this episode and our entire podcast on social media and have their friends share that as well because we want to tell them that the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast organization is uh, boosting its posts of each episode from Spreaker on its Facebook page and searching for local advertising sponsors. If anyone has a business that's interested in sponsoring this program, send our Facebook page a message. I'm Taylor Phillips. Follow me on Twitter at DT2Phillips and Buck Gino at Buck Gino the third. Three eyes for all our numerals. Like and share the Michigan Sports Truth Facebook page and join its Facebook group. I will talk to you next week on two, episode 287. Thanks very much for listening, downloading, sharing, and sharing. TTFN. Ta-ta for now. Oh, Mr. T.